Good evening, everyone. My name is Chen Zhao, violin professor at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the live stream Tiny Dorm Masterclass featuring James Ennis with our remarkable college and pre-college conservatory violin students. James Ennis is one of the most sought after violinists on the international concert stage. His playing has a combination of stunning virtuosity, serene lyricism, and extraordinary musicianship. He is a favorite guest soloist of major orchestras around the world. And in fact, he was scheduled to play the Mozart Violin Concerto Number no. 3 with our San Francisco Symphony this week. I'm sad that we're not able to hear him on the Davies Symphony Hall stage due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we are so thrilled that he could join us online to offer his insights to our conservatory students. I know you're tuning in from your homes in every corner of the world. I just want to thank you for showing your support um, for our San Francisco Conservatory Tiny Door Masterclass and Concert Series. These live stream events are made possible by all of our hardworking students, faculty members, and our administration team. We would especially like to thank Harry Winston for the generous support and the longtime partnership. Let us know in the YouTube chat box where you're watching this from. We would love to know. If there is time at the end of the masterclass, we can answer a few questions that you uh, type in the chat box. So I also want to thank my colleagues at the San Francisco Symphony for promoting this event. Our musicians and our social media team have been working day and night to provide inspiring music videos to everyone around the world. And special thanks to all my friends from CZ Violin for helping us promote in your Instagram stories. We're so happy that you are tuning in with your friends and followers. On behalf of my violin colleagues, Ian Swenson, Simon James, Sasha Branchek, Kay Stern, Cordula Merckx, Joseph Miley, we present you five of our five violinists this evening. Kai Yuan Wu, Bo Xianzi Vivian Lin, Grace He, Eden Lona, and Celine John Kim. They have been asked to submit pre-recorded videos to reduce any possible internet lag. Once the video concludes, um, James will start working with them. Now, let's begin this highly anticipated violin masterclass. Ladies and gentlemen, here's James Ennis. Hello, Tim. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Oh, James. Yeah, so are you in Florida? I am. Yeah, I'm home in Ellington, Florida. And uh, yeah, I've been here for a little while. And it's I mean, it's a nice place to be. I certainly wish I was with all of you in San Francisco um, now. I was really yeah, looking forward to that. I was really looking forward to it. Um, so anyways, I uh, you know, want to share a story that I remember the, my, the first time I met you. I think it was my second year at Curtis. And I went to New York City to visit my violist friend, Leo Suzuki. Yeah. And Leo, invited me to a quartet reading uh, with you and Ed Aaron. Um, and on the way to Ed's apartment, Leo told me, oh, you know, James just recorded the first album, you know, the Paganini 24 Caprices. And so I got a little bit nervous, you know, just <laughs> hearing that, going to a reading party. And, uh, but then Leo said, oh, don't worry, James is super nice. And so, and um, I had a great time reading and uh, I've been, you're one of your, I've been your fan for a long time, and I'm so happy to have you at the conservatory. Well, and, thank you, thank you. Can yes. you. It's hard to believe that was um, that was more than 25 years ago, or something like that. A long time ago, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, and you also now that I'm so happy to hear that Ed Aaron is also your. You continue to play with him, and he's in your Ennis String Quartet. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing those connections that you make at uh, well at the age of of the students that we're going to hear tonight. You know, a lot of the friends that that these people are making right now, they're going to remain their friends and colleagues uh, and people that they play with for the rest of their careers. It's a uh, it's an exciting time. Yeah, that's so great. Well, let's, uh, we can get started with our first violinist, uh, Kai Yuan Wu. Kai Yuan is from Shanghai, China. He's finishing his uh, senior year here and studies with Ian Swenson and myself. He will be playing the uh, Izai 6 Sonata. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Hey, bravo. Bravo. Great performance. Where are you right now? I'm in San Francisco. Oh, you are in San Francisco. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for playing that. It sounds, uh, it sounds terrific. You know, the, uh, before I forget, and I, I hate to start with something like this, um, but there's just one note that I, I don't want to forget to tell you. Um, what edition are you playing off of? The Shermer? The Shermer. Okay, great. So it is the, let's see, the it's the fourth page of that. Uh, make sure you play a B sharp on the bottom of that. Wherever that goes. I think you kept a, a B natural on the bottom. Do you, do you see where I'm talking about? Yes, I saw. All of a sudden it started pouring rain here so I can barely hear myself think in my own room. Um, one other little note, and it, again, these things, there's so many weird little details in these eyes, it's easy to lose track of one, one note. It's the very next page. Um, <laughs> Make sure that that's an E and not an A. The very last note of that line. Um, so basically, I mean, it's it's a it's a really good performance. You know the piece really well. You're you're surmounting the uh, the technical hurdles. Um, I think that one thing it could definitely use is um, to speak of it in a purely technical sense. I think that sometimes you can just use a faster and more intense vibrato. It's, um, it's a very solid and round sound that you have, but I think that uh, in this piece, sometimes you just want a little bit more sort of uh, pizzazz. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what's a good example. Can you take just from there and just think of playing it with, um, with real extroversion, you know, and try to speed up the left hand vibrato and uh, have it all just a little bit more fiery. Yeah, I mean, I really liked that E, for example. I think that was good before. I mean, it was a little bit like it was it was beautiful, but it felt to me like the character was it didn't have that sort of um, that sizzle to it that I was looking for. Um, can I I think that I'll have you play a bunch from right about there because it doesn't apply so much in the opening. But in general, in this piece in particular, but I would say in e with these eyes music in general, um, there's a real challenge that as we violinists learn it, um, there's so many notes and we spend so much time just getting around the notes that there's a real danger of kind of losing where the music is. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of that I think has to do with pulse. Um, I find often for my taste, when I hear people play Isai sonatas, too often I have a lot of trouble when I listen objectively, I have a lot of trouble following sort of the narrative of what's being said or where the pulse is because, you know, as we learn them, as we get to play them, we add in rubato that is both intentional and sometimes unintentional, you know, for technical reasons. But I think in this sonata, exa uh, for example, you've done that has got to be basically within at least the big beats there has to be a pulse even if it's just by the bar so that people kind of know where it is this you know how you have all those funny all those funny offbeat things they don't really they don't have the effect of being on off beats if you don't know where the on beats are. Um, so can you take, um, I mean, you can even just start on an E. And just play it a little bit straighter, like as if someone needed to take some dictation. Oh, <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, that that to me was the sort of thing where you want that to kind of be your base. And then you can find flexibility within that. Uh, because I think that, you know, it's a funny thing with rubato. It's like the, this whole idea of sort of rubato, like stealing time. Um, I think the great, maybe the greatest master of that was, was Fritz Kreisler. And he... It's in quite incredible if you listen to him play how he his playing will be so flexible and it'll be kind of moving all over the place. But in terms of the big beats of pulse, they're locked right in there. When we get to um, that section a couple pages later. <laughs> I think again, you want to have that dum, da dum, bum, bum, ba dum, bum, bum. You want that bar pulse to be somewhat more regular. The more regular it is, the more freedom you have to go around it. Um, I thought that also, as a general thing, that tempo could be a little bit faster. That one to me uh, got a little bit, a little bit stuck. Um, like uh, a few, a few lines down. All that stuff, the those little breaths of the rests, I think those, um, it, in the tempo you chose, to me, they sort of stopped the music. Could you play a little bit from that dum, ba dum, bum, bum? You know, it sounds like, uh, sounds like Carmen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm going to stop you briefly here. Um, you, the first two bars, you treat the the uh, dotted sixteenth and the thirty second note differently than in the third bar, and in a way, you actually you treat it, if anything, the opposite of how he writes it. You extend in those first two bars, you almost double dot it, right? <laughs> And then that bar, you basically play more in tempo. My suggestion would be uh, to keep it a little bit more strict, not to double dot it quite so much. And so in that third bar, where he has those lines in the third and fifth bars of that section, I think for me, that, that line, that, that tenuto, is it's like a hesitation to go on to the next note. You know, you've established this pattern. That little weight, that little hesitation, I think is a nice, nice effect. Um, can you just go on from there? Start uh, just from the Allegretto. Okay, so sorry. I'll, I'll even right again. It sounds like ticket, 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 da da dum, bum, ticket, 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 da da dum, bum, dum. One, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two. Should be your base, your your starting point. You know. Great. Can you play that much again about 5% faster? Oh, um, the that overall is... tempo. What's that? I mean the overall tempo, right? Yeah, the overall tempo, just about 5% faster. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'll, I'll stop you for now. I, I think this is a general tempo it works better. And you know what I think it is, as I'm hearing you play it and as I'm thinking about it more, I think that any slower than that, and it really starts to feel too much in, like there are two strong beats to the bar. And I think there needs to be one that bum, da dum bum bum ba da dee dum bum ba dum ba. You don't want dum da dum da dum. So just think of that one per bar, that propulsion going forward, and uh, you know the second to last line of that dee da ba da dee dee be da da da. Make the audience feel the strong beat of the bar, even though you're not playing it. Da, 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 da. Um, the, if we have so little time, I'm gonna uh, skip back. Actually, no, you know what? I will skip back in a little bit, but I wanna talk about something right near the end. Um, I'm not gonna attempt to play this. <laughs> it's the third into the fourth lines. Well, maybe I'll just... Uh... All that stuff. When you get up to the da 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 by the time you get that that needs to be in the same tempo right you know Isai writes things like that often which are frustrating for violinists there will be a certain passage where it's very natural and very easy to play it fast but then all of a sudden there's something that's really hard to play that fast you know so so be just be careful about your pacing um since we're so short on time you don't need to play that for a moment now but just careful with that pacing that basically it is going up in tempo and then coming back in tempo that you don't have strict changes um and then the last thing just before i'm afraid i have to go on to the next person it has to do with it's the bottom of the second page that <laughs> all that stuff that is a very difficult effect to pull off it's like i was talking about earlier in the piece how when you have those sforzandi that are on off beats they only sound like off beats if we know where the beat is right and i think that bit where we have those tenuto off beats it's very important to know where the strong beats are could you go from the last bar of the second to last line <laughs> and really try to telegraph to me where the beats, where, where, where the bars are. That's much, much better. I think that um, if you think of it, can you play that for me? Just no grace notes, no chords, just. Almost. <laughs> One more time, really feeling a di da 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 di di da. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's, that's what we need to hear. And with all that other stuff that comes around it, there's a lot of stuff in his eye that just needs to be kind of fit in somewhere. Um, uh, that, for me, will make a very big difference. Um, 
make sure, and this is the last thing I've got time for, I'm afraid, before that Pew Vivo that starts a few lines later, when you have to do um, but um, but da da beam, but um, but da da bum, but um, make sure that that tempo is at a place where you can be faster. Deem, but um, but da dee dee, da 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 da. I think this is another great example where that bump, but um, but da da bump, but um, isn't really that hard. So we all have a tendency to sort of play that pumoso, and then we actually get to the pu vivo. And it's like, oh, well, I can't play even faster. So, <laughs> uh, so again, watch that tempo relationship. And I think that that'll help the gradual building up of excitement for that passage. So, yeah, I'm afraid we've got to move on to the next one. Thanks so much for playing. It sounds wonderful. You can miss that. Bravo. Bye. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you. 
Beautiful. <laughs> Where are you right now? Are you also in San Francisco? Yes. All right. Well, um, terrific. I mean, we can talk about the piece in two parts, um, but I think actually the main thing uh, that I want to say kind of applies in different ways to uh, to both of the sections, um, and is actually sort of what I was talking about to um, to our last violinist is. I, I feel like um, I could use a stronger sense of the pulse uh, and of course in the recitativo that's a very um that's a very free sort of thing but i think that there are certain relationships um that i was losing uh, you know time and tempo and pulse relationships um why don't we start with i'll just have you play a little bit of the recitativo from the beginning and I'd like for it to feel, it doesn't, um, I don't think you need to play the beginning slower by any means, but I'd like for it to feel somehow less active. Um, like the, the, the overall movements of pulse are quite slow, you know, that, that, that there's, there's this sense of, of, of drama unfolding at a very, very slow pace. <laughs> Actually, here's here's a little example. Um, if you were just playing, there's a certain. Um, there's a certain shape that that has, and the way that you were playing it, you were actually sort of. You were kind of moving into beat four, into beat two, and into beat four, and I don't think that that quite held the drama of the harmonic changes. Um, can you think of that bar as one uh, one thought? I guess you just take from. To, uh, to look at me, but can you take it from home? Can you take it right, just right from there? Okay, so, so the... Um, I mean, that is, that is the descending line, and I feel like you're sort of stopping in the middle and then starting it over again. Okay. I, I, I think that really the, the grace note in the middle of the bar is just reinforcing the chord. So dynamically, can you shape the whole bar, or the first three beats of the bar in any case, shape them down? Because, I mean, you really, you're going from resolving to a major to a minor. I think the whole thing can be a diminutive. the B flat through because really the that t that top line there um, it's the only place where you're where you're stopping and, and you don't have to you know and in this next couple of bars 
that rest I think is important and similarly the next bar <laughs> You know, it, it's, um, I always think about when composers wrote these things until the last few years where people started using compo uh, computers, they always used their hands and ink. And it's like, it would have been way easier not to write those like intricate little 16th and 32nd note rests and extra flags and all this. It's like, there's clearly a reason why he went to, to the trouble of doing that. Um, anyway, this sort of applies throughout this. Sometimes the transitions of, of uh, momentum, I think can be a little bit more gradual. Like, uh, let's see, where is it? that needs to be more of a gradual process rather than now I'm going to get, I'm going to play faster. <laughs> um, actually, that would be a good place for you to start. Could you go from the, uh, it's the third bar of the fifth line. You went from da di da 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 di da di da di da da. Your tempo changed really dramatically. I think that the accelerando that starts there, if you want to kind of cheat that back a couple beats, that's fine. You know, you can start the momentum going, but I think that you lose the drama of. <laughs> You know that, that it's all rolling downhill. Can you try that one more time? Sorry, the um, it's a little bit, unfortunately, hard for me to hear this over the connection. I'm going to have you start that over again, but I will say that you know where you start the the tremolando on the bottom line, and it's piano. Yeah. Uh, for me, like the way that you're sort of making that work, and it does work, is to put like a very significant fermata before that passage starts. I sort of think that you might want to think about um, if the whole passage starts to fade away. Then you don't, you're already basically at a piano. So I think of the whole passage leading to a piano. For me, it makes more sense than it seems like such different and unrelated material when you end the previous passage strong. Anyway, that's just a matter of, uh, of uh, opinion and taste. <laughs> but can you play right there from where the tremolos start? I, and hopefully my computer speakers will, it's clear. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, the um, the top you're not changing the top note the way you have to. So great. 
Great, great. Um, now let's let's go on a bit to the um, to the scherzo. For me, um, I want to I want to have a clearer sense of 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 a presto scherzo from the beginning. It was like you played the first. I don't mind the first two bars, you know, being a little bit kind of playful and maybe slightly understated, but they felt to me quite held. And then the third bar really took off. So I think maybe if you can kind of round the edges on that idea a little bit. Okay, so there, like, what, what's your tempo? Da -da -dum -bum -ba -da -dum, or da da dum bum ba da da. I mean, they're, they're too, they're too disparate for me. Yeah. Uh... Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, I was waiting for you to go on. Please go on. <laughs> seems like this is the tempo that you really actually want to play it at, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, can you take the opening? And really bring out those accents. Yeah, great. And you know what I think can help the opening bars is if you feel it, the second and third beats don't need to be so prominent. So. Boeing, I think, should give you a bit of a guide that I think you can have that same feel to it, even though you're doing separate bows. You know what I mean? Yeah. It felt a little bit too uh, a little heavy somehow. I think think of just playing honestly play the eighth notes faster. Da da dum ba da dum ba da dum ba da dum. Okay. And, and the last thing is is and this is, is very subtle, but remember that it's da da dum da da dum da da dum, not da da dun da da dun da da dum. Stop you briefly here. That um, I think again, right there, that energy go the passage that's and the passage that's they're all the same basic thing, and because of them being different bowings, different dynamics, different places. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it's certainly not just the way you're playing. I mean, almost, I think one of the biggest challenges for any violinist is, is making them feel like the same impulse, even though they're technically played in different ways because they're different dynamics, different bowings, et cetera. But um, 
think of think about making those elements more similar in terms of you know that the ear can lock into that and be like right that's that important kernel of information that we that we hear often and then um <laughs> That formata, I think, can be more dramatic. I think da da dum bum, da 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 da. You know, not overly done, but enough so that the listener is really drawn in. Like they're, you're delaying that satisfaction of the downbeat. Um, last thing, because uh, I'm afraid we need to move on. I was just going to make a suggestion, and this is something that works for me at the end. Yeah, it didn't work there. Yeah, those harmonics, that double one, try that on an up bow. Mm. Yeah, I, at speed, I think you might find that that will work well for you. In like that particular double false harmonic, often that kind of thing, um, the weight of a down bow can cause it to be a little bit less reliable, but you can sort of catch it with the up bow. And I find that it will speak more consistently that way. You know, something you can, uh, you can try. Oh, and one last thing I forgot. Make sure that the that you don't start the glissando until the beginning of the next bar. You really want to have that dum ba 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 ba. All right. Well, I'm afraid we have to move on, but thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for playing. Thank Stay you. safe. <laughs> See you in San Fran one of these days.
Sounds great. Um, well, I mean, it, it's it's very, very well played. I, a, a few suggestions from the beginning. I feel, um, again, this is just personal taste, but I feel like the theme is so, it's so surprisingly simple that I think it can be played more simple. You know, that I think that in any, in any theme and variations, it's often really difficult to create sort of a, a an overall arc for the piece, just in the nature of how it's written. But, but certainly, I mean, this is this is a really masterfully composed piece, and I think there really is a, a strong dramatic arc through the variation. So, I think that if there is something very reserved about the theme that is in a way quite strict. Um, it's the easiest thing that he's, I mean, in this, in this volume of Caprices, it's the easiest thing he's written in 55 pages, you know, and there's something odd about that, you know, and it's going to get, it's going to get nasty fast, but the I think there needs to be something kept in reserve. I mean, it, it is such a fascinating melody. Obviously, everyone, everyone in musical history since it was written has found it fascinating. But there's something beguiling about it, and I think part of it is the reticence of it to say too much. Can you play that opening theme, just thinking a little bit more held in reserve? <laughs> Okay, so one thing that I'm hearing is there's a slight acceleration to the second half of the bar. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but there's a tiny hint of that, which to me, I, I feel a little bit unsettled. I'm not getting the sort of clockwork of it. Something like that. Um, I think another thing that's really important about this theme is it, it's the first establishment of four plus four plus eight. And I think that, uh, for example, that you know, almost thinking of it like a speech pattern, there needs to be a little bit of punctuation in those places. You know? there um anyway that's uh that's just my feeling of, of the best way to sort of set set it up from that point uh first variation was very good um i'd like the second variation to be a little bit more um i don't know a little more diabolical a little bit less controlled can you play that one for me where it's just a little bit more sort of skittish mm -hmm. Great, great. No, but but I think that um, I think you can make sure to put the emphasis on the second beat. Like right now, it sounds like a hairpin on the first beat that goes away from the. Uh, but I think you want to get more to ah uh, dum ba da. -dum.
Yeah, it's, I'm trying to form my thoughts on this. There is a crazy storm going on where I am, by the way. Like, I don't know if you're hearing like crashing thunder. <laughs> it's absolutely <laughs> wild here. Um, I feel like there can be sort of a thickness and a heaviness to this variation. Um, you know, there's there's this great marking that he uses sometimes that I'm just thinking that if it has this this kind of uh, heavy staid quality to it, you know, you've got the skittishness of variation two and variation four, but the, the... Oh, that was not close. Um, you know, it's it's unusual that it has a forte and it's you know third and fourth strings, the accents. Can it just be a little bit heavier, a little bit more into the string, a little bit more of a thick sort of sound? I like that very much. On the repeat, you uh, it was like it was like that you sort of gave out in the first bar and started it again in the second, and I I, I sort of lost that. I, I couldn't quite figure out why that happened. Um, just thinking harmonically, it it surprised me not in not in the group. <laughs> I mean, can, you, can you just do that one more time? that this kind of this there's a kind of a throatiness to it the whole thing that and it was it was there was something sort of dark about it too i really liked it um in stuff like this you know how pagnini will be like oh here's a nice melody but you have to play it in octaves or you have to play it in thirds you have to play it in six whatever it may be um i think it's useful to pick one of the lines and play it you know <laughs> and you know how would you shape it experiment with it see what ultimately what your musical decisions would be were it not so hard <laughs> you know um Anyway, uh, going on, this next variation was very good, but I think it can be a little bit, um, I think it'll be more dramatic if it's even more legato and more sort of uh, mercurial. Mm -hmm. Great, that was really good. Um, in the second half of it, if you can hide the shift as much as possible, um, I mean that that is a really a really small detail and something that you're playing really really well. <laughs> but but you know that if if um, I think that's one of the things that gives it away for being tricky you know you hear that do you hear that shift and the ear kind of locks into it it's like oh this must be hard you just want it to just all be sort of pixelated and, and dancing around uh this next variation i think the most precision possible with the 16th notes um you know you often hear it where it's kind of and it's like wow that's <laughs> that sort of takes the fun out of it. I think really very clean is the idea. I think it sounds uh, really, really neat that way. 
um, and the accent on that fourth beat, I think, is really important too. Can you just take right on that variation. <laughs> You know, what it, you know what it is? It's the upper octave. It's the fourth note. That that one is not quite clean. It's always that fourth note of it to make sure that that one really speaks. Because right now, it's like the lower octaves are working great. It's the, the upper one. I just missed that little bit of clarity. Um, going on to the next variation, I, I might suggest uh, sort of a trick fingering that I came up with not really all that long ago, maybe 10 years ago or something that helped me because I always find like if you shift on the bar, which I think is what you were doing, right? <laughs> that it's very difficult to really get the G sharp high enough, the F natural low enough. Mm -hmm. So what I started doing is so I'm going three one three one. Or I'm gonna... <laughs> so I do three one three one over the bar line, and then on the F A, I switch to four two. I find that it fits in the hand a little better, and at speed you can hide the shift so you don't hear it, and then. Um... <laughs> I guess I shift maybe on the second note there, but it's that one in particular in that lower octave to make sure that that F natural is really low. Mm -hmm. That one sounded, and because the thing is that if it's played as an F sharp, it doesn't really sound wrong. It just is wrong, <laughs> you know? It sounds okay, but... So um, don't don't worry about changing the fingering in that upper one for now. But um, can you play that? Really watch the lower F natural, and then the first set of tenths. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's I guess it's the third, fourth, and fifth notes of the second bar of tenths. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Really think of on that F A of kind of bumping the hand and bumping the elbow in a way. Like if you bump the elbow under, it, what it does is it spreads the hand from that minor 10th to the major 10th. So I, I find that that's like a little physical tweak that can uh, help out in the tense there. Another little trick is on the uh, going from the DF to the CE. Mm -hmm. Basically, only think about moving the first finger because mm -hmm. the first finger moving that a whole step will move the fourth finger a half step. <laughs> you know, I think that if you think of moving the hand, then the E gets too flat. You see oh. what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, that's um, that's a a trick that helps me sometimes. Um, variation seven was very good. Oh, gosh, so little time. Uh, variation eight. You know, I I like the idea of putting them all under slurs. Like I think, I mean, it's cool to play them as chords. That's the way I always heard it growing up. But I think there's this really weird kind of organ effect of, of putting them all under slurs for those chords. Something to play around with. Um, it's, 
it's kind of cool sounding and it's also a really good etude of figuring out how to do that you know on your particular instrument how you can exactly how much pressure and where on the string you can mm -hmm. play to get three voices speaking equally um is that variation nine with the the pits was really good really good the um uh particularly the first half of it you know was just absolutely crystal crystal clear could you play the second half of variation nine you know i think um it's fine i've been thinking about this in in my own playing with some stuff involving left hand pits i think sometimes we focus so much on the pits that we don't pay so much attention to the bow and the sound that it's making <laughs> there were a couple places where um and it wasn't like it was a consistent thing that's the thing like some notes spoke really well others seemed a little bit like you were just kind of slapping at it and they sometimes were sounding sometimes they weren't um and I, I probably am only noticing that because I was noticing like the exact same thing in my own playing like <laughs> the day before yesterday. Uh, so pay attention to that. Um, if you really feel like challenging yourself uh, with doing something really difficult, uh, it's the third bar of the second half. Like, you know, there, there's a regularity to his pattern of, of it's uh, like, Bow pits, 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 bow pits, bow pits, bow pits, bow pits, bow pits, bow pits. And technically he has whatever those notes are. So that bar, the third bar of the second half, should also be a bow pits, pits, pits. Because it really changes the effect when you have a da 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 when you rearticulate that second one with the bow. Um you it i don't know it's really hard to do but i think you can do it <laughs> um variation 10 i think can breathe in a little bit more of a regular pulse in a way it's like this is really the calm before the storm and i think that if it's too sort of rhapsodic and moving around we we lose that opportunity of sort of calming our audience, almost lulling them into this like false sense of, uh, of security there. Can you take variation 10 thinking very, very placid, very, well, yeah, I guess placid is the word I'm looking for. I feel like there's another word that's on the tip of my tongue, but it's not coming to me. So can you play that uh, variation 10? Well, you see, that, like there, for example, you know, you have this, um, it's like this kind of massive acceleration through it. And I'm wondering if that sort of spoils the mood of something that is just a little bit more reflective, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Like that, that to me was just so like, it, it just relaxed my ears, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. ah, and now, now go right into uh, the, the, well, not the finale, but the variation 11 right now. I think I think that you've come this far. I don't think you want to take your foot off the gas. <laughs> you know, I think that this can drive more consistently. This can can really, um, I don't know. You know, there there was a sort of a delicacy of where it's like, okay, now we're sort of relaxing a little bit. I don't think this is the time to relax. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Great. Sorry, and this is so mean to stop you right here of all places. Um, you know the um, those notes up all the time when you get up to the top there. I think they can be a little bit more martelé, a little less sort of. Uh, the the stroke seems a little bit staccato ish, you know, and I think that that if they're a little bit more martial, a little bit more driven, it keeps more intensity through it. And um, all that stuff. I think that um, I want to hear I want to hear a bar by bar bar pulse here. <laughs> that we don't, again, take the foot off the gas. We don't allow the audience to sort of relax. Like, uh, it, it gives people that chance to just reset. And I think the drama continues. Yeah. Um, I'm just take, uh, oh, you know what? Uh, the other thing. Why don't I remember? I know I've played this piece enough times. I can't remember the notes. That bit there. Make sure that that bottom line really lock in on the intonation of the bottom line and the shape of the hand, and then it kind of falls into place. Like right now, it feels a little bit like I'm not saying it looks like this, but it feels a little bit like oh boy, there's all these chords in different yeah. places, but. I think in a way you're overcomplicating it. It's really the bottom line and the shape of the hand, and then it kind of locks into place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, can you just take actually right from there, so three bars before the finale? <laughs> For me, that's just, it's just too much time. It's like, it's not just one of these, it's one of the, oh, oh, okay. You know, like it just, it allows everything to sort of settle. Like, I think that there's, you know, it's one of those things is like, it, 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 what it sounded like if I were taking dictation is it was like forte broken chords, mm. grand pause, armada, next bar or something like that, you know, instead of dotty, 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 dotty. Yeah. Like there's maybe enough time to to let things speak or to let the notes ring, but again, don't uh, don't break the tension too much. I think it's a it's a bit of a lost opportunity. I I'm afraid I've really got to uh, I've got to move on to the next person. But anyway, it sounds great. Thank, Thank you very much for playing and stay safe. See you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. 
Church of uh, San Francisco. They're letting oh. me practice and record here because I'm. Oh, that's very nice. It looks beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> Where in Norway are you from? I'm from Oslo. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. How how is everything back back home? Uh, it's okay. They're doing much better now. Um, oh, glad to hear it. So yeah. Yeah, I was supposed to be in Bergen in about a month and a half or oh. so, but that's not happening. <laughs> um, Thanks for playing this. You know, I, uh, Hank sent me um, that you were, you were thinking of, of playing a, a Norwegian piece. And I wish that, uh, that had I had the time to, to really look at it, I would love to hear that. So next time, okay? No, I'm happy uh, to play this since you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, I think that maybe the, um, the approach of the little Bach snippets I think of them as being a little mm -hmm. bit um, now. Apparently, apparently this this prelude uh, from the third partita was Thibaut's warm up, and yeah. he just played it all the time. And I think there can be something to it that is. <laughs> I, I hesitate to to use these words for, but but almost like thoughtless, you know, just mm -hmm. sort of you know the the type of thing that you do all the time. Like it's interesting to me that. Piano, leggero, staccato over all of those notes. That's not the way anyone actually really plays the preludio, but it's like, if it's a piece that you play literally every day, you know, th there's something about it that's just without a thought or a care in the world. You know, the, the, I think the drama mm -hmm. of, the, of the contrast. I think that uh, for me, that's effective. And then when we get into the. I, I would like for it to feel like it's just kind of. Um, There's, there's a regularity of the propulsion to the Bach preludio that I think he is tapping into somewhat in this first movement here. Um, and once we get to that, um, what edition are you playing from? Just so if, we, if I need to talk about it. the Henley. Okay, hold on, let me get the Henley so we're <laughs> looking at the same thing. Great. So basically, it's that um, bar 11. From that point onwards, I'd like for that to have, momentum-wise, the same sort of feeling of a... You know, when we play that piece, and it just it just kind of goes, you know? It's, it's almost like, like driving along a, a, a road or something. Could you take from... So that there's lots of variety of articulation and little um, 
bits of inflection and all this, but it is all basically moving on a, on a path that is uninterrupted. Mm -hmm. Sorry, right. can I um can I stop you briefly? Can it be a little bit, a little calmer somehow? Mm -hmm. Like I think that, you know, that that this whole DS era thing in this piece, I think is, is pretty dark, you know, and I don't think that we want to necessarily be too stressed out at this point. This is like a moment of calm before we really know what's happening. There's something uneasy in the music, but it can be somewhat reserved. to tell it's hard to tell over these microphones and speakers but i think the uh the, let's see i think that the piano can be there can be a quality of sound to that that is almost a little bit, um, a little afraid. I don't know quite how to describe it, you know, but it's not only soft, but it's reticent somehow. And I think that the mezzo forte is only a mezzo forte. It's like, it's like the tone of voice you use when you're speaking very seriously about something, but not feeling like you need to necessarily say it to the whole room, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's plenty of room later. Like, I mean, the, the piece is full of these dynamic contrasts. And I think that you wanna make a very, as big a difference between a mezzo forte and a forte as you're making between say a forte and a fortissimo or a piano and a mezzo forte. Um, going back though, I think with those slurs, I would almost, cheat the bowing a little bit to almost overlap the notes a little bit so that they're very very legato on the slurs mm -hmm. and i think as much contrast as <laughs> so there's always a, a real contrast of um of articulation um i'll have you actually do that whole thing one more time from bar 11. All right, actually, there, there's a there's a good example of uh I mean not to make too big a thing of it, but that we definitely hear the differences. I think that basically bar thirteen can be shorter. Okay. Um, I think that um, if that mezzo forte there in bar 24 is really subito, I think that's more effective because in a way it's like you have these kind of um, these voices that are almost arguing against one another or, or something. And I think that if you lead too naturally from one into the other, you lose that sense of very disparate elements. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, 
And then the next time. That one has the diminuendo. So um, let's see, you know, when, can you start from bar 20? I'll stop you for a couple little things. Uh, that little bit there at 31, I think I'd prefer to hear that Bach quote to just happen almost as if maybe it was always sort of happening in the background. Like, I think that the time you're taking, I mean, you need to, you need to somehow round that edge a little bit, but I think the amount of time that you were doing made it seem sort of like, and now we're doing something else. And I, I think that maybe that relationship somehow can be a little bit more ambiguous. Like, oh, wait, how did we, how did we end up back there? Like, I didn't think we were there anymore, you know? Um, the I think that that forte at 42, this is one of those spots where I think you can sort of fool your audience a little bit. Like um, you want to reach a forte uh, in bar 42 that sounds very strong, like that is sort of your peak thing but you actually have to have enough in reserve so that the fortissimo at 43 is like, whoa, okay, no one was expecting that. Um, you know, so just make sure to keep, don't keep your expression in reserve because I think it's like the forte, the intention of that forte at 42 was great, but I think that you need to have enough sound in reserve for 43 to even be slightly more uh, ferocious. Um, Let's see, going on to the final page. That bit, I don't think, um, for me, it didn't work that you, you played that uh, somewhat slower than the rest of it. And I think that mm. it, um, for me, it, as a listener, I lost a little bit of that connection. I think that the real, the layering there of the theme is really very, very interesting. Could you take from the top of that page, bar 61? Great. You know, I, again, I would suggest um, not necessarily framing the the changes the way you are. Like, um, so I guess it's the bar sixty six into sixty seven. I'd like to hear sixty seven be. I don't know more more of a little unexpected interruption. Like, oh, you're back. You know, like these two voices that. The lower voice starts at the second voice sort of responds, but as it's responding, the lower voice cuts in again. And then again, that it was sort of always there. It was always going on. Um, when we get to the Menomoso, I think that stretching the note as much as you were made it very difficult for me to hear a sextuplet at all. Okay. <laughs> like I, it sounded to me sort of like it was eight quintuplet, eight quintuplet, eight quintuplet, which is, which is fine, but it's one of those things. It's like he, 
definitely could have written that. <laughs> so I think that also the... Um... You want the bottom voice and the top voice to have somewhat similar characters. So if you really stretch the bottom one, it makes it kind of difficult because you don't really want to stretch the upper one quite the same way. Mm. So um, I think that also stretching it too much, we lose a little bit of that accumulation of the chord that happens with the with the arpeggiation. So, um, and I think that really the accumulation of sound in this passage is really, really spectacular. Um, can you play just, uh, just a little bit of that metamoso at the end? Can you, can you go somewhere in the middle of that and what you did before? Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. That was great. Yeah, I think that uh, the last thing I'll suggest is uh, those top notes, I think, could have a little bit more sort of drama to them, whether it's a kind of a punch from the uh, from the bow hand or a little bit of a vibrato in the left hand, but ju just so that there's something a little bit more, a little bit more bite uh, in that upper voice. I think that that will right. contrast. Can you hear me? You cut out for a second. Uh, you oh, okay. The top um, voice to have more bite, right? Yeah, a little bit more bite. So you've got. <laughs> so that there's kind of an equal sense of drama to the both to the two voices, even though they're not really doing exactly the same thing. Uh, right now, I thought that the top one seemed a little bit somehow gentle. <laughs> that kind of thing anyway mm -hmm. um i'm afraid i've got to move on to the next one thank you very much for playing thank you so much. take care <laughs>
Sorry. <laughs> hey, that was gorgeous. How are you? Good. How are you? Um, I'm all right. Um, let's see. I guess we'll start with the Saraband. Uh, beautiful playing. I think. Um, I think that sometimes uh, it was funny. It was like sometimes the pulse for me moved at different rates. Like, like sometimes it felt, it, it was not an issue of tempo at all, but it was like, sometimes it felt like a slow stately saraband and that at other mm -hmm. times it felt like I was hearing more beats, which made it seem to move faster. And then I would start hearing it slower again. And there was a certain, I guess I wasn't entirely, um, convinced of this feeling of a saraband throughout at times i was and at, at other times i wasn't quite quite following it um mm -hmm. can you can you play from the beginning just a little bit and thinking of the importance of the one two and one two which often through this piece is kind of the the important uh, impulse there playing in that bar, but it's quite a bit faster than what you were playing at the beginning. And I think that there are times when, there are times obviously where you can have some sort of rhythmic flexibility, some flexibility of pulse, you times you want to move forward, times you want to pull back. But I think we kind of want to know basically where we are uh, in terms of the tempo of the movement. And I guess I guess I feel like there, we don't ever want to feel stressed in this. You know, if it's if it's kind of overly overly vibrated on every note, you know, it can start to feel a little bit like a dog that's straining at the leash. You know, <laughs> I think there needs to be a sort of heaviness, a certain kind of staid quality. <laughs> Think of, of where you want your clock to be set, so to speak. Um, from the beginning? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. for just just a second um going back uh into the first little bit the, uh, if we didn't have chords and other things to worry about i think there's a natural connection from that a to the c sharp in the sixth bar to feel it's almost like there's 
um, a momentum where you need to go through that note into the C sharp. And I felt like it started over again. It was like, oh, that's a little bit of a, <laughs> this struck me as a bit of a lost opportunity. Um, <clears throat> there were a couple places that were similar. When you're going from the second beat into the third beat, um, <laughs> Um, I think that you want to be careful of where your listener feels that third beat because they're going to feel it somewhere, even though you're not playing it. And I think that, so it's like you, you need to feel that yourself and then move off of it like there's a clock in your body. And it doesn't have to be exactly in time, but you just, you know, it's like the beats that we don't hear are in a way more important than the beats that we do hear. If we hear the beats, then it's like, oh, we can do all sorts of things with that. But if we don't hear them and only feel them, it's really important we pay attention to that or else it just creates this feeling of uncertainty in the listener. Like, where was it that you just, where was it that you just stopped? Um... <laughs> It's like, oh wait, where where is that? Are we on one? Like, where do those notes fit in? You know, it, it, we we lost track of where three is, and we lost track of where one is going to be. You know, so Um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of room for flexibility within something that's a little bit more structured. Um, can you play? Actually, can you play from bar 22? Do you have bar numbers? This would be uh, two full bars before the second ending. Are you there? Uh oh, did our friend disappear? Did I disappear? What's going on here? Hello? Uh, I'm here, but I'm not. <laughs> hey, Jen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm afraid we may have lost her. Um, yeah. She, she, maybe a connection thing. She's in Korea. Oh, she's in Korea. But oh, well. yeah. Oh, she's coming back on. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> hey, you're back. Hi. <laughs> good. I'm going to stop myself. Okay. I think you're still muted. 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 Sorry, the internet was yeah. disconnected. Oh, okay, well, I'm glad you're back. I thought you were like, Me oh, this guy, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm just going to cut him off. <laughs> 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 um, I was wondering, could you just start from two bars before the second ending? So I think this ending is really crucial. When it starts from the second ending, moving into just these very regular 16th notes, we don't want it to start feeling too active or somehow like we're hearing twice as many beats. Like sometimes I hear this piece played and you've got this beautiful sort of slow three saraband and then you get to the second ending and you start hearing all the half beats. And it just kind of, it's like, wait, now we're in a fast movement. How did that happen? You know, so if you can keep that feeling of expanded pulse. So to borrow it for second ending? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. <laughs> To me, it feels a just, it's very, very slight, but it feels a little bit like you're rolling down the hill. Like it's just, it's it's making my, my uh, inner self feel just a little bit too tense. I think there needs to be something a little bit held, a little bit more um, reflective, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. <laughs> 
Actually, you can take just really, um, well, no, the same spot, two before would be great. That was exactly it. Like that it just, it, it to me that still flowed in this slow, stately kind of three. Um, I think particularly if you end up playing this with the repeats, um, I like to sort of frame that second ending as a little bit more of a coda, like. Um, So from the lower D, it's like there's a little bit of phrasing that happens there, but also it takes on a slightly different voice, a slightly different character, more of a coda. Um, I think that's, if you're not playing it with repeats, it, it, it doesn't have the same significance. But if you do with repeats, think of that as like this section is, like it's kind of an unusual thing in these works for Bach to have this coda the way he does. And uh, it's quite special. Um, the, the Gigue was really, beautifully played I, I think um i think it can be a little faster actually like i think it mm -hmm. can just dance a little bit more and um i started thinking to myself like it was it was so good that i was like what what am i going to say <laughs> but but i thought you know it sounded to me like it was written in 3 8 instead of 12 8 and i always find it curious why and how Bach chose the meters that he writes in. Um, you know, it, it, in a certain sense, you take a look at it and it's like, well, what difference would it make if he wrote it in 3-8? And it's like, well, one would think that then the units become smaller. <laughs> this sort of there's like a there's a buoyancy and a momentum that goes through the bar and i think that that works better uh at a slightly quicker speed i think that also you know after that sarah band that the g can be such a uh, a welcome bit of uh virtuosity you know i think that um it, it always amazes me how bach was I mean, he loved virtuosity. You know, yeah, it's it's amazing when you when you come across um, these these violin bits. Uh, you know, I think of like the fourth Brandenburg Concerto or something like that, where the violin just goes absolutely haywire. You know, and then those spots in the first and last movements, like he loved that. And I think that for whatever reason, I think that the tradition for playing the sonatas and partitas for a period of time, it became so serious. It was such serious mu music that people were afraid of the virtuosic elements that I think are very much a part of it. So all that to say that since you do play it so so well and so you know technically comfortably, you might wanna just experiment with letting it go a little bit more and uh, allowing it to flow, allowing it to dance a little mm -hmm. bit more. And uh, I think that'd be great. And uh, I'm afraid that we are now out of time <laughs> but wow i i hope you are staying safe in korea with any luck i'm supposed to be in seoul in july but if i have oh. to do a 14-day quarantine i have a feeling that might not work <laughs> anyway thank you very much for playing it's beautiful Bye, thank you thank you Thank you so much, James. Wow. Oh, very well. Have a break. I wish I could offer you some uh, drinks or water. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that was really that was really fun. Uh, it's 
Wow, must be a pleasure working at your school where the, the students are so, so good. It's, it's, so it's always been fun. Yeah. So I really, really thank you for all this. And it's such an educational treat for us. Um, and I love some of the um, fingerings you, are, uh, you were suggesting. And also, I just love the, your, your variety of bow strokes. It's so amazing. Um, well, thank well, you. Yeah, I'm well, learning too. Uh, always yeah. trying to uh, to find yeah. you know, it, it's it, it find new new tools of expression somehow or another anyway <laughs> yeah so anyways we we already reached a two hour um uh session and uh you know it's, i know it's pretty late in florida so i think you should get some rest uh, <laughs> yeah maybe yeah. So. yeah so thank you again and um yeah, and well, I hope you, well, I hope you will visit us at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music in the very near future. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. No, I look I look forward to it. I've always really enjoyed my my trips to to San Francisco Conservatory, and of course my my times with the symphony. So, yeah, yeah with luck, I will hopefully see you all soon and uh, and be able to congratulate all all these players in person. Yeah, thank you, James. Well, you. ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for watching our uh, SFCM Tiny Door Masterclass with James Ennis from your homes in every corner of the world. Stay safe, stay healthy, keep on playing your music, keep on posting your music. Have a great evening.